at the bottom. Okay, welcome back into our Backyard Brothers podcast. It feels like it's been a while. Uh, we uh, didn't we didn't have a uh, recording last week. Uh, holidays, uh, a couple people sick, uh, end of the year, uh, and then the week before that we were live. Uh, if you haven't seen that video uh, or heard or feel like we've been absent from podcast, it's because it was a YouTube live video. It's not available on a podcast system. Uh, and so if you want to see that one, we had a guest with us. We had uh, our dad, our backyard father uh joined us and we talked about uh how we became fans of our favorite team we talked about some nba we talked about some nfl uh go go see that one it's on our channel on our live videos uh, a little bit longer than usual um uh we are getting back right into the swing of things as well here though so uh Welcome, Dustin, Cody, and we are going to jump right into uh, our normal schedule here with a memory from Dustin. Yeah, since it's uh, college football season, or at least that's that's wrapping up, I wanted to share a memory of, of perhaps one of the greatest college football games of all time. This is the 2007 Fiesta Bowl, Boise State versus Oklahoma. Um College football fans, at least at least those of you that are nearing 30 will remember this one. Um, 30 or older, probably. But this this is, again, one of the greatest college football games of all time. And this is one of the first times that a non-major division team was invited to a major bowl. In fact, I'm not sure about the statistics, but probably the second time. Uh, first time was was 2004 with Utah, and then here 2007 with Boise State. You know, this is this is a team. Boise State at the time was in the I think it was like the Western Mountain Western Atlantic Conference or something like that. I don't remember what it was, but they they had a very weak schedule and they were not being respected at all by by any team, and they they were lucky enough to be invited. That's how it was seen. Lucky enough to be invited to play in the Fiesta Bowl against Oklahoma, who who, recently, who lost last game of the season and were kind of demoted from national championship contenders to this Fiesta Bowl against a weak team. It was going to be it, – it, it was it felt kind of like a, like a demotion. And, and Boise State comes in and within the first five minutes scores two touchdowns. And then scores kind of even out a little bit over the game and some mistakes happen. There's, I think, I think Oklahoma threw two pick sixes during the game. And then with about a minute left in the game, it's tied game, minute left in the game. And Boise State quarterback's name, I think his name was Zabransky, threw a pick six. Oklahoma's up by a touchdown with a minute left in the game. Boise State gets the ball back. And they throw a couple of passes, get down to about the 50-yard line, and then through two incomplete passes, and you got 13 seconds left in the game. And, and it's fourth and 19 or something like that. It's just there's just no no hope. And they run just the gamble of all plays. Again, it's like fourth and 19. They throw it about 15 yards down the field. Guys a few yards short of the first first down marker, and there's less than 10 seconds left on the field they got 30 yards to go to the end zone and as he's running just about to be tackled he pitches it back to somebody else called the hook and ladder play and guy completely throws off the defense and he runs in for a touchdown Boise State ties the game up and sends it to overtime and then in overtime Oklahoma gets the ball first Pretty much first play of the game, Adrian Peterson, who we all know now is, is going to be first ballot Hall of Fame NFL running back, one of the best to ever play in the NFL. 
pretty much first play of overtime runs it in touchdown. And so uh, Boise State gets the ball. They they struggle a little bit, but they eventually get into the touchdown as well and, and tie it up. And they decide, you know what? We got to go for two. And at that point, it's probably one of the most famous plays in college football history, what they called the Statue of Liberty, where they lined everybody up on the right side. And it was most obviously a screen play. They got two yards in to go. They're going to play. They're going to say, hey, we're going to block and throw a screen. And Zabransky fakes the screen and hands the ball off to his running back behind his back, who runs in completely untouched, uncontested. And is jumping, shouting, throws the ball into the stands. That was probably a million dollar ball. Throws it into the stands and Boise State wins the game. They, the whole David beat Goliath. And it's so interesting. Dur- during this happened, the last, the last bit of the game, the last 10 minutes after the game, the announcers are saying, not only is this incredible, but it absolutely shows that these teams, these mid-major conferences, deserve to play against the big dogs and they even talking about a college football playoff at that point in 2007 we eventually got one which hasn't allowed any other men major ones you could call tcu who's now in a major conference but cincinnati last year it's 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 in cincinnati last year thank you but it's it's amazing to one of the greatest football games of all time and it has set a precedent that is pushing this momentum for a expanded college football playoff, which is coming, you know, 15, 20 years after this game, which, which did this. So what are your thoughts on this memory? I know I've talked for a lot. I, uh, I remember. Um, so this is one of those games that, uh, I got home late. Uh, I think I was out with some friends, and so I wasn't watching uh, the game. But I, I, I came home and I, I turned it on. It's probably almost midnight at this time in Arkansas uh, that I, that I turn on the game, and it's the fourth quarter. Uh, and I watched the rest of the game and I'm already, uh, I turn it on and say, okay, how much is Oklahoma beating the Boise state by? <laughs> uh, and so I turn it on. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's at the point at, uh, where it's tied at 28. And I think within a couple of plays, uh, Jared Zabransky throws that horrible out, uh, that ends up being the pick six. And I'm like, well, there it is. The, the, they tried. Uh, and then that amazing hook and ladder play and then the whole overtime like you said adrian peterson scores a 25 yard touchdown first play of overtime and i'm like well uh this is either gonna go a long time in overtime or it's gonna end right here because they can't stop oklahoma 25 yards out uh, not with adrian peterson and so but i remember this game as being it was it was amazing to watch the uh just the the last a uh, few minutes of the fourth quarter and overtime for me. Uh, it 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 brought the magic of college football, uh, and I've never seen a game quite like it. Uh, I mean, you can talk about after the game too. That running back proposes to his girlfriend on the field, <laughs> uh, the, the the cheerleader, and uh, and the announcers ask both the quarterback and the running back, "Do you think you you deserve a shot at Ohio State?" Uh, and like you were, you were saying there that they were talking about it at that point, they were, and uh, I mean, uh, if I remember right, Ohio state loses the national championship game to LSU, um, that year. And so no one except Boise state in the entire country is undefeated at that point, uh, Boise state, the only undefeated team in the country. Uh, and like you said, they, they played a kind of a, an easy schedule in the whack, but they, they proved it by beating the big dog, Oklahoma, who, never even gave Boise State a second thought before that game. The, uh, and we've seen it now uh, almost every year in the college football playoff era. We've seen some kind of school uh, go all the way uh, and, and make some big, big plays. Western Michigan went undefeated a few years ago. Uh, and uh, they they kept saying we're the national champions because we're, we're the only undefeated team. Uh, they beat Auburn in the Fiesta Bowl, I think, to go undefeated. Uh, you have, we, we talked about Utah back in 04 beating Alabama or 08, was it? I, 08, 08 yeah. or 09. 09, 09. 09. 09. Utah beat Alabama, but in 04, yeah. that was kind of the first BCS buster. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
and then you got uh, uh, Central Florida did it a few years ago as well. Cincinnati, obviously, last year, although they lost in the in the college football playoff semifinal, still they were there. Uh, and so we, we're, we're seeing this and it's it's so important to see these little guys. I mean, you, we, we talked about the NFL draft prospects and, and, and evaluations. I don't think a single player from Boise State played in the NFL in that game. I don't think a single player did. Uh, Ian Johnson didn't that running back Dave, uh, David or Jared Zabransky, David Zabransky, whatever his name was. Uh, I don't think a single player, maybe a maybe a wide receiver, but uh a bunch of guys from Oklahoma. Most of those those guys from Oklahoma had a shot at the NFL, and it's just so fun to see that that kind of um, those little that little dog mentality. Boise State has been a power since. But uh, anyway, one more thing, and then I, I promise I'm done. That uh, hook and ladder play. Um, when I played when I played high school football, uh, we uh, I was a wide receiver. And uh, we had a play that we had set up that I was designated as uh, as the re- as the receiver that would pitch the ball. We called it the Boise State play. That's what we called it. Uh, and it was a hook and ladder play. It was our only real uh, trick play that we ran. Um, we, we, we ran a spread offense in Central High School. And so there's four receivers on the field. Uh, I was I was one of them on the outside. I didn't didn't play the slot receiver in this particular position. I played on the outside, uh, and so uh, I, I kept waiting and waiting and waiting because I didn't play a whole lot. But that was my play. That was the play that they said, "Hey, Scott, go in. Uh, we're running the Boise State play," uh, and it happened once. Once in my whole career <laughs> at in high school football, uh, we were winning by like three touchdowns at the time. And they're like, hey, why don't we run the play? Scott, go in. Uh, and so uh, um, I'm going in and I'm shaking. I'm like, this is going to be uh, fun. And we're running the Boise State play. And so I run about a, a 15 yard hook. The ball is right there. It's perfect. Uh, I catch it and then deliver the the uh, hook and ladder play to his name was Jeremy. I can't remember his last name, but he's the slot receiver that's coming around. Uh, I'm expecting to get nailed from behind here as I, as I, uh, pitch the ball, but apparently I was that wide open because no one hit me. Uh, and I, I, I pitched the ball and we run, uh, it was a very successful play. It went about 45 yards, got us down to the one yard line and we scored the next play. So, uh, that's one of my greatest memories from playing high school football is running the Boise state play. And I'll always remember, remember that. So. That's awesome. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember watching the game at that, um, at that time at that age, probably cause I, I don't think I really cared that much at this time, but I do remember, you know, obviously watching the highlights, hearing about the Statue of Liberty play, hearing about the Boise State hook and ladder, all this stuff and, and watching it on replay many times since. And, um, one of the things first off is I think it, it really cements the, um, the ability for trick plays to work. I think, you know, that people see like these, you know, obviously trick plays were done before this too, but, but it, it shows like, you know, trick plays can really work and they can win the game. Um, and second, um, <clears throat> as we look at this game and a couple of those BCS busters we've talked about beforehand and what we've seen since the thing that always happens in college football, always have to be thought, thought about is upsets. Upsets always happen. in college football um, and um we're, we're talking about how oklahoma didn't even give a, a thought to um to Boise state how they could win and stuff and and that also made me just think about um uh the usc tulane game that just happened and i know it's a little bit different um circumstance you know tulane wasn't undefeated or anything but but um usc was kind of in the same same kind of area where they were knocked down they're kind of been demoted and um they also had the same mentality. Like really we, we, we get Tulane after a great, great, great season we had. This is, this sucks. This is stupid. And Tulane comes in and they, they show them who's boss, you know, they, they well, not really who's boss, but they win by like a point. Um, and when the game, and I was just thinking about that as well, but upsets will always happen. And that is what you were talking about, Dustin, about the expanded playoff, how it's so needed. And I think that this game <coughs> excuse me, and all these, um, these, little dog mentality games that are showing these upsets are, are so important because 
I guess they help us realize that it's not just these power five conferences that really are, you know, mean something or really that important, but teams like Boise state teams like Tulane teams like, um, I mean, Cincinnati and, and you name them, they can play ball. They can play ball. They have good players. Um, and, um, games like this will teach the power five teams that you, you have to treat each game, each team like the, like the best you have to play the best. And that way you can, you can uh, be ready to, to go in and play. Um, so that, that's my thought on that. Um, but since we're talking about, um, you know, these little dog, dog mentalities, these teams, um, big games, um, sorry, you got something, Scott? Uh, I just had to uh, correct something I said, and it's a Mandela effect where I attributed something earlier because I was just thinking about it. I graduated in 2007. So the, actually, I played football. I, I played this play before <laughs> Boise State ever won the game. And so I attributed it, it earlier. So uh, I just realized that. I'm like, wait a minute. We couldn't have called it the Boise State play. It's a, w- a weird uh thing where uh, I attributed something afterwards. It's called the Mandela effect, I believe. But uh, anyway, so sorry. No. <laughs> uh, you're good. <clears throat> um, anyway, so I was talking about the, the little dog mentality in these big bowl games. So we have on, on Monday, the ninth, I believe it is, we have the national championship. Georgia, big dog, Georgia, uh, defending um, champion, taking on TCU of all people um i'm pretty sure there's not a single person on this planet who would have told you tcu is going to be the national championship um i definitely wouldn't have i would i would have said you're you're high out of your mind and and um i remember i remember even going through and, and making predictions for all these teams i think i predicted tcu to go like five and seven or something again and the uh i think it's a fiesta bowl as well uh, the peach peach bowl fiesta, fiesta bowl um and and kind of just proving you know they've they proved all year long that they can they beat i think five ranked opponents now um and that they just beat michigan on one of the biggest stages and so i guess the question is i mean we, we know we can take tcu seriously now that that question has been answered we can take them seriously but are they going to be able to beat georgia the big dog i want to hear your thoughts scott and dustin Sorry. Uh, we all said that they Sorry. couldn't beat uh, Michigan. Uh, I, I think back when we were talking with, with, with them a uh, week and a half ago or whatever it was, I think we went down the line and said, no, uh, TCU can't beat Michigan. Uh, we, we said, I don't know how they got here. They they were in some games that were like, yeah, they're probably going to lose this game. And then they won it. So uh, I think, I don't think any of the four of us uh, a couple weeks ago thought that they would even beat Michigan. And they handled them pretty easily. And so, and, and I think uh, one of our first podcast episodes, Dustin, you you had said they just need one game. It's it's not a series, you know. It's a, they can beat they can beat Georgia once. If and 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 you said then if it's a four game series, they're losing in or if it's a seven game series, they're losing in five. But they can win that one game, uh, and that's what what I'm believing more and more now. I still uh call me a, a skeptic I, I i still just don't see if george is playing their best game i don't see tcu beating him but obviously T- uh, if, if georgia plays the kind of game they played against ohio state uh which was they, they weren't playing their best game they threw they had a couple of turnovers they uh they had to come back and win at the end if they play that kind of game where they're they're not necessarily at their uh, at their best and TCU can can beat them because TCU I think is going to make it close. They are a powerful offense. They're a surprisingly good defense, uh, and so if Georgia makes a few mistakes and TCU is playing their best best ball, TCU can win that game. But to me, it has to come with that caveat that Georgia has to make a few mistakes to let TCU win the game. Yeah, I I so I there's a guy that I I work with. His name's John, and he he played football at TCU. He was he was a he was a defensive end at TCU back in back in the nineties, right? And and so when I I talked to him, you know, a couple weeks ago, I said, 
do you think that TCU has a shot against Michigan? He says, oh, absolutely. We could beat them. I was kind of like, <laughs> okay, sure. Right. Cause then all of us all said the same thing too. He says, no, I don't think so. And, and, you know, John was right. TCU did great. They did fantastic. And so I, I find it interesting that here we are and, this underdog mentality, you know, and this whole big power five conference, I think even people that have seen the magic before, all of us that have seen it before and that we want TC to win, we still say, oh no, George is the big dog. Michigan's the big dog. USC is the big dog. They're going to win. It's going to be no contest. And so it's, that's where this underdog mentality comes from. And it's, it's, uh, what, what's the difference between the players that are recruited by a small team like TCU and the players that are recruited by a big team like Georgia, the players recruited by a big team like Georgia, they've probably been watched since they were 14 years old, since they're a freshman starting on the football team already, you know, looking like they're 25 years old at 14 years old, huge, huge, great, fantastic the players and they're just like, yeah, you're going to, not only are you going to go to a top five SCC team, but then it's straight to the NFL after that for you, you know, and since the time they're like that. And then TCU, while they do great recruiting and have great players as well, it's not exactly the same. Um, and it's, so it's, it's interesting that probably the players that are playing for a smaller team have always had that underdog mentality and always come in, playing fighting for every single bit of, of yardage of points that they can get and so i am i am on the tcu bus i want them to win i want it to be a blowout win i i and I, I really hope and and i hope that tcu is is national champions so my last thoughts on that before we move on is <clears throat> um so georgia Georgia, obviously, you know, they're the big dog. They've been on the national stage several, several times, not mentioning last year. And a lot of these players on the team have that experience of being on the national stage. They have that experience. Kirby Smart has coached and won um, the national championship game. Um, he's coached and done an undefeated season before. Um, and so they have that experience. They know what to expect. TCU hasn't been on a stage like this, at least with the current players um for a while and then they have first head coach um first year head coach Sonny Dykes who's been <laughs> fantastic their quarterback Max, Max Duggan um I I expect a lot from this TCU team and like you Dustin I hope that they can pull it off that'd be that'd be a really cool fun story that TCU um you know unranked preseason came in and just showed the world who they were and won the national championship that'd be cool to see that I don't think it'll happen though I want it to happen I think Georgia has the experience. They have the, the 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 mindset and the players and the coaching to to have to get it done. I hope I'm wrong, but maybe I'm with Scott and then I'm just kind of a skeptic and I just have to believe it or see it to believe it. But um, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I do think it'll be a good game, better than people expect. But um, hope TCU wins. I don't think it'll happen though. <laughs> um, so what's, with, what's with, interesting, if I can interject and comment on that again, it's just like the player, the players for TCU, players for Georgia, right? Everyone's both human, right? They just as human as as each other, and, and there's it's it's kind of comes down to to the coaching. Is is, is Georgia can't be a better team because they're just as human as TCU, and so it's kind of like it's really just that's why they play it, right? And I, I think it's. It's so interesting that the reason they play the game is because you can't look at two teams and say that one's Goliath, that one's David. It's a no contest because, hey, David beat Goliath, right? Yeah, good point. Um, okay, moving on. Um, a little bit to more of a, I, I guess you could say a somber um, idea, but also positive because we can talk about it. But um, let's talk a little bit about DeMar Hamlin. Um, I'm sure everyone – in this in the world knows who Demar Hamlin is right now, um, but he um, Bill safety number three on Monday Night Football playing against the Bengals. Um, T Higgins caught a pass. Um, it was uh, for I think it was for a first down and and just a normal football play, you know, just like we see every single play, every single 
game. And then afterward, gets up and he just collapses on the ground. Um, the trainers are there immediately and they're giving, giving him CPR um, on the field. And I know, I, I don't think this is anything to this extent has ever happened on a football field this serious. That was terrifying to watch, um, horrifying. And thanks, thank goodness to the to the, the the trainers being there so quickly and administering that CPR that he was, you know, he's he's doing better now. He it was just reported that he, he's off the breathing tube. He's breathing on his own. He's talking. He's face from the Bills team. He's he, he's there. He knows what's going on. He he was like, Who won the game? And the doctors have told him, You won. You won the game of life. You know, that's all that matters right now, is you're living. And um, and so I guess my thought that I want to talk about is, you know. We know injuries can happen in, in, in football. That That's expected. But something like this, this is a cardiac arrest on the field where your life is, is either gone or not in a matter of minutes, that's never been talked about before. Is this something that we need to, you know, maybe be more concerned about? Um, what about, you know, what about kids playing high school football or, or things like that? Is this something that, you know, maybe parents or kids should consider more before playing? What are your guys' thoughts? So I can comment first here. It's it, it's amazing, you know, and reading and seeing all this, you know, CPR administered and also defibrillation, you know, his heartbeat had to be restored. And, and so I'm no doctor, but if your heart's not beating and you're not breathing, that sounds dead to me. Right. And 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 so no doctor, he wasn't dead, but he didn't have a heartbeat <laughs> and, and, and it had to be restored. And and it's. I, I, as I've read about this, maybe you've read about this, this something like this has happened one time before in the NFL in 1971, a player named Chuck Hughes suffered a heart attack on the field and he died. He, he died. Um, an NFL player died on the field. It's happened one time before. And so it was so extremely serious that, yeah, that canceling the game was absolutely the right decision. Um. But as far as the question of, of kids playing football, you know, football is a collision sport. It's an injury sport. And there's a great number of what I would consider serious injuries that are non-contact injuries. You know, there's AC, many ACL tears are non-contact injuries. Um, Achilles tendon tears are usually non-contact injuries. But then there's our contact injuries such as, you know, broken bones um, or concussions that are serious. And so even if we go crazy and say, okay, football all across the world is now two hand touch. There's going to be still a great number of non-contact injuries that can sideline a person's life. I mean, all of us probably know someone that was like, wow, they were a great high school football player. What happened? It's like, oh, they tore their ACL twice. And so non-contact injuries are still going to happen, even if you remove the contact from football. And so their NFL and, and football all throughout the, the country is trying to make it safer. I, injuries are still going to be part of the game and serious injuries, maybe not this serious, are still going to be part of the game, no matter what precautions are taken. Yeah, um, I, I do agree with that. And uh, it's, the, the the players that uh, so I, I um the the there hasn't been an official diagnosis but a lot of MDs have uh, have speculated that it's called commodio cordis uh, and it's where you get uh, a big force into your chest at the exact millisecond where your heart is going through an electrical um, rhythm. Uh, and there, there's like a 30 millisecond window. And they said that, uh, so the, the one I was watching or reading said that there's usually about 30 cases of this in the world every year. Um, so it's so little, it's so small, it's so rare. Uh, and, and when talking about football, it's even rarer still because it's a sports injury mainly, but it, it usually happens in baseball and hockey. Those are the two that it happens in most when they get hit in the chest by the ball or the puck. That, that, that's when the, the, these happen. Football, like this has not been seen. Like football, is, it's so rare to begin with. And in football, it's even rarer still. Uh, because usually those pads kind of distribute the, the, 
the 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 weight and the force uh well enough that it doesn't ha- doesn't have much uh much effect there um so should parents be concerned about their kids playing football yes they should but not for this particular reason this is so such a freak injury this is such a freak moment uh <coughs> excuse me um a lot of uh obviously concern and prayers and things like that have gone out to Demar Hamlin, his family and, and all those affected and they're, they're well warranted. Uh, and it's so great to see him making the recovery that he has. I'm sure he still has a long way to go. Uh, and whether or not he plays football again is a whole other story that doesn't matter right now. It's about him uh, getting back t- to health. But th- what I would be concerned about if I'm a parent with of a, of a kid playing football is concussions. That's still the big, big one, the head injuries. That that's what I'm concerned about as a uh, as as a parent of a kid playing football. Um, so yeah, th- there's definitely worry. There's definitely concern. But I don't think the the rare the rarity of this particular injury is so rare that i don't think we it needs to be concerned about all that much for parents um we have about six minutes for two more topics and so i'm going to try to blaze us through this one which is related to that uh so the nfl has officially canceled that game the bills and Bengals will not be played this season uh, that means that they will play one less game than everyone else in the NFL. That also means there's a couple of of strange AFC playoff scenarios. Um, right now, the Chiefs have the the top seed because they are 13 and three, while the Bills are 12 and three right now. Uh, so that's why they they have that. Obviously, if the Bills win and the Chiefs lose this week, the the Bills get that that top seed easy. But if they both win, then they both have three losses. And there's a scenario where if those two teams meet in the AFC championship game, they're playing it in Indianapolis or, or Detroit or a, a neutral field. We, we, we haven't seen that kind of thing before where there's not really going to be a, a, a home field advantage because of that. So there, there's some weird playoff scenarios going on if those two teams meet. Um was so um was this the right move uh, i mean obviously the juju of that game notwithstanding you don't want to uh, want to bring those two teams together maybe but it's there's not really a great answer for this because there's some teams with some disadvantages but was this the right move and and and, and what's going to happen for the afc playoff picture both the bills and the Bengals are in it <coughs> So to comment, it's I, I think that it's it's the only move they can make and therefore the right move because if you if you force them to play, they're having to play three high intensity, high emotion games within within 10 days or less of each other. And that only increases the risk of injury, but also gives an unfair advantage to other teams, uh, to the other team that has to play them because they have less time to prepare, less time to recover. And all of that, and so I, I think it's absolutely the right the right decision. And I, I think that the the mental taxation that these two teams, the Bills and the Bengals, who are both most likely going to be playoff teams, have had to go through during this time is it's just as much, if not more, than playing a full game plus you know six rounds of overtime. And so, yeah, right move. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think that you know if, if something like this had happened you know, seven weeks earlier in the season, they would have been able to find something, figure something out and, and have a have a game played and stuff like that. But at this point in the season, where there's only one week left for the regular season, this is definitely the right decision. And obviously the right decision to, to cancel the game. There's no reason or need to finish a game like that after something like that happens. And so um, I, I agree uh, with you, Dustin, that it, it, it's, it's the right call. Um, and I think that for the scenarios for the playoffs, it's really the best you can do for this kind of um, scenario, which, you know, is unprecedented. You couldn't expect this. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I would agree. Okay, so moving on to last topic, we're going to talk about the historic event in the NBA that happened almost a week ago when Donovan Mitchell of the Cleveland Cavaliers scored 71 points in a game. 
um, provide provide a little bit of statistics here. This is a game went into overtime. The final score was one forty five to one thirty four with Cleveland winning. Donovan, so overtime total minutes of the game was fifty three minutes. Donovan Mitchell played fifty of those minutes. He only sat for three minutes, but still scored seventy one points, had eleven assists and eight rebounds. Went 22 of 34 from the field for 65% field goal percentage, 7 of 15 from three-point, that's 47% three-point, and 20 of 25 from the free-throw line. He scored 20 points from the free-throw line. Most most players are not going to score 20 points in a game. He got that being able to stand still and think about it. Um, and so this was this is an amazing offensive performance and and did absolutely fantastic. 71 points. It puts him top top 10 all-time points scored in a single game. Um, and it's amazing how efficient he was. You know, 65% from the field is it is, you know, 20 to 30 percent above average. Um, and so amazing. And I'm I'm love to see a, a great player do a great thing. I want to know if you had any any comments here in the last minute that we have on that. Uh, yeah, the, the only comment I have because we're running out of time is it was amazing to watch. I watched the highlights and uh, the fact that he's six foot one, uh, he's listed probably more than that, but he's only six one and he can go into the lane and he can make crazy shots over guys a foot taller than him uh it's not just three pointers the guy is is an all-around 100 offensive player and it brings to mind the kobe bryant 81 points uh, and that kind of level of play yeah my only thought is it, it's it's ridiculous um <clears throat> looking at it and and i don't you know this is a one game thing where he, he made 71 points and obviously he's making tons of points he averages 29 a game um, and so with this game here, my thought is it enters him into the conversation. Is, it, uh, is he the best player in the league? And so um, that's a that's a that's a conversation to have another.